Assalamualaikum students. I am Dr. Tazim Rashid, and the topic that we are going to discuss today are clinical features, diagnosis, management, and complications of sepsis or SERS. To begin with, we are going to discuss a lot of definitions. Uh, the first definition is that of sepsis. Sepsis is a clinical syndrome that complicates severe infection. It's the body's immune response to any severe infection and is characterized by the signs of inflammation that we all know are vasodilation, leukocyte accumulation, and increased capillary permeability. And this occurs in areas that are removed from the site of infection. Now coming to SIRS, what is SIRS? SIRS is very similar to sepsis, okay? They are very close to each other. The only difference is that SIRS is a clinical syndrome that complicates a non-infectious insult. Example, acute pancreatitis or pulmonary contusion or ischemia, inflammation, trauma, or several insults which are combined together. So sepsis is a systemic response to infection and it is identical to SIRS, except that it must result specifically from infection rather than any non-infectious insults that can also cause SIRS. Pulsars. Okay, so they are very close to each other. They are phenotypically similar and underscore a common inflammatory pathway, which cause both. So, in other words, sepsis is a systemic response to infection. SARS is an identical response, but most of the time, SARS is to a non-infectious insult. Okay, now if we look at this diagram, this is called the Venn diagram. On one side of the diagram, you can see infection. On the other side, you will see this SERS. And in the middle, there's sepsis. So sepsis overlaps with both infection and SERS. And the causes of SERS, like shown here, are trauma, burns, pancreatitis, or if it can be a lot of infections. And the both intermingle and the both result in, they're very close. So that the diagram that was shown before, was the diagram that showed sepsis and it lies at the intersection of infection and the systemic infection syn response syndrome. Now the infection might be a culture proven infection or it might there might be a high clinical suspicion of infection. And even if there is a high clinical suspicion of infection, that is even suffice to define it as sepsis. And the source of infection might not, might not only be in the blood or bacteria, but it can be at distant sites like urinary tract, like respiratory, abdominal, or any other. And many non-infectious clinical conditions may lead to a clinical picture of SERS, such as major trauma, surgery, burns, pancreatitis. So some of the common causes of sepsis are bacterial infections, which are the most common. In the next slide, we're going to see which are the commonest infections. Sepsis can also occur as a result of fungal, parasitic, or viral infections. Okay, and usually the fungal infections we see in patients who are immunocompromised, who are diabetics, who are in chemotherapeutic agents. And the infection, like I said, it can originate from anywhere in the body and it can cause damage to any system of the body. And also there might be unknown cases, one third of all cases of sepsis, so like I said in the previous slide, that sepsis can occur in culture proven cases or in cases where there is a high suspicion of infection. So the body will respond to it. Now the common infections that can result in sepsis in 35% of the cases, uh, there's lung infection, 25% has a urinary tract infection, others 11% can have GI infection, so the most common infections, respiratory infections, we have in respiratory infections, we have pneumonia. Uh, the patient might present in sepsis secondary to a urinary tract infection, secondary to gut or bowel infections, skin and wound infections like necrotizing fasciitis or a patient that has received some sort of trauma or a road traffic accident, and then they develop infections or um, in patients who are IV drug abusers, the infection might be at the injection site or the surgical site infections. The importance of identifying the source of infection is that once you get a patient with sepsis, we're going to discuss the clinical criteria later on, it is very important to identify where the infection is. Because once we know where the infection is, only then we will be able to treat it. As we all know, 
that there are different antibiotics for different sort of infections. So till you get to such a proven infection, you have to start your patient on antibiotics. Therefore, the source of infection needs to be identified. Coming back to the definitions, we have the definition of infection. Now, what is infection? Infection is the invasion of normally sterile tissue by organisms, meaning a tissue hair which is normal and that has been invaded by organisms. This is called infection. Second definition is bacteremia. Bacteremia is the presence of viable bacteria in the blood. So the difference is bacteremia is the presence of infection or the bacteria in the blood and infection is the invasion of organisms in the sterile tissues of the body. This is the difference. Okay, now if we have a clinical definition, what exactly is SIRS? SIRS is the systemic inflammatory response syndrome. And what is it? It is a clinical syndrome that results from a dysregulated inflammatory response to a non-infectious insult. In other words, SIRS is the body's immune response to a non-infectious insult, which might be ischemia, pancreatitis, or anything that occurs. Okay, so what is SIRS? It is a clinical syndrome that results from a dysregulated inflammatory response to a non-infectious insult. In other words, it is the body's immune response to a non-infectious insult and it might occur at distant from the original insult, okay? So two or more of the following abnormalities are required in order to diagnose SIRS. The abnormalities that we get are a temperature greater than 38.5 or in a, or we see in Fahrenheit, so greater than 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit or less than 96.8 degrees Fahrenheit. A heart rate greater than 90 beats per minute. A respiratory rate greater than 20 breaths per minute or a partial pressure of carbon dioxide which is less than 32 millimeters of mercury. Meaning, if a person is hyperventilating, if they have a high respiratory rate, then they're going to wash off the carbon dioxide. This is also one of the criteria of SIRS. The other criteria is either a leukocytosis or a leukopenia, meaning if the WBC count is greater than 12,000 cells per cubic millimeters, or if it is less than 4,000 cells per cubic millimeters, or there are 10 or more than 10% immature band forms are present. Now, these are the criteria of SIRS in order to diagnose SIRS. And if two or more of these are present, then you can diagnose this as a systemic inflammatory response syndrome. Okay, now SIRS and what is sepsis? Like I said, the differentiating point between both is SIRS in response to a documented infection or a highly suspected clinical infection is sepsis. And uh, it, the infection, like I said, might be a ruptured bowel or at the time of surgery or a wound infection or a urine infection or whatever. Now the diagnostic criteria are, of sepsis are, the, are similar to those which we have already defined of SIRS, but you need to have a culture proven or a visually identified infection. So what is sepsis? It exists if two or more of the following abnormalities are present along with either a culture proven or a visually identified infection. So the same, we have a temperature greater than 100.4, less than 35 degrees centigrade, a heart rate of greater than 90 beats per minute, a respiratory rate of greater than 20 breaths per minute or a partial pressure of carbon dioxide, which is less than 32 millimeters of mercury. Uh, you can have leukocytosis or leukopenia. If you can have a WBC count of greater than 12,000 or less than 4,000, then again, if two or more of these criteria are present along with a culture proven source of infection, then you can identify this as sepsis.
then we have another definition and that is of severe sepsis so severe sepsis it refers to sepsis at at least one of which showing at least signs of hyper hyperperfusion or organ dysfunction so in severe sepsis you have signs of sepsis plus signs of hyperperfusion or organ dysfunction the signs that you might get are areas of mottled skin a capillary refilling that requires 3 seconds or longer decreased urinary output which is less than 0.5 ml per kg for at least 1 hour or if the patient requires renal replacement therapy or dialysis if the serum lactate is greater than 2 millimoles per liter we will uh, discuss lactate in more detail once we go to the investigations if there is abrupt change in my mental status if there are normal eeg findings or if the patient has a low platelet count the patient is in disseminated in vascular coagulation great distress syndrome or if there is cardiac dysfunction so coming back to this severe sepsis is sepsis the signs which we have discussed before along with signs of hyperperfusion or organ dysfunction okay so if these signs are present then we will discuss define it as severe sepsis then this another definition which is that of septic shock now what is septic shock it is that it is sepsis or oh, sorry severe sepsis plus one or both of the following and what are these signs these are if the systemic blood pressure is less than 80 mm of mercury or if it is uh, sorry less than 60 mm of mercury or if it is less than 80 mm of mercury if the patient had baseline hypertension and this blood pressure persists despite fluid resuscitation or the second criteria is if the pers person has a systemic blood pressure of greater than 60 or greater than 80 if baseline hypertension is present and the patient requires dopamine greater than 5 micrograms per kg per minute you don't have to learn the dose or if the patient maintains the blood pressure but the patient is on dopamine dobutamine epinephrine norepinephrine and despite adequate fluid resuscitation meaning uh there are two criterias one or both might be present the first one is if the patient has systemic hypotension despite fluid resuscitation the second is if the patient is maintaining the blood pressure but requires dopamine norepinephrine or epinephrine in order to maintain this blood pressure now there's another slide just to recall what we have done is sirs when two or more of the criteria are present one is that of temperature the other of heart rate respiratory rate of more than 20 or leukopenia or leukocytosis sepsis is sirs with documented infection severe sepsis is sepsis associated with organ hypoperfusion or organ dysfunction and septic shock is sepsis with refractory hypotension in spite of adequate uh fluid resuscitation what is mots mots is multiple organ dysfunction syndrome and when uh, this occurs when after septic shock this failure of two or more organs so that homeostasis cannot be sustained without support now in this slide we are going to discuss the risk factors of sepsis the population at risk of developing sepsis is large and at any given moment approximately 50% of the icu patients have some sort of infection and they are at risk for sepsis and uh, the patients may be having high bacteremia they uh, the risk factors are advanced stage patients who are immunocompromised who have comorbidities like uh, malignancies renal failure hepatic failure aids immunosuppressant medications patients having community acquired pneumonia or certain genetic factors when the patients are immunodeficient then they are at risk of developing uh, sepsis and infections okay now the non infectious mimic infectious mimics of sepsis might be acute mi when they might present with hypotension pulmonary embolism acute pancreatitis fat emboli syndrome adrenal insufficiency or it might be drug reactions so coming now to the investigations <laughs> 
the investigations that are required are a full blood count like I had previously discussed to determine uh, leukopenia or leukocytosis, a coagulation profile with prothrombin INR. This will be deranged if the patient develops severe sepsis with the uh, DIC. Uh, urea electrolytes to check the uh, renal functions, the liver function tests, the serum lactate and the arterial blood gases in case if the patient is hyperventilating and uh, to look at the oxygen and the carbon dioxide content. Okay, now coming to the serum lactate, I have mentioned an investigation serum lactate over here. What is it? And evidence has shown that increasing lactate is a predictor of outcome in sepsis. And it has been shown that patients who have lactate values of greater than four, they have significantly increased mortality. Okay, like previously discussed, lactate values of more than two are seen in severe sepsis. And if the patient has a lactate value of greater than four uh, millimoles per liter, then they will have significantly increased mortality. Another investigation which is done in sepsis is interleukin-6. Patients with uh, sepsis and increased interleukin-6, they are at increased risk for developing complications of sepsis and multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. So another investigation that can be performed in patients with sepsis is interleukin six another investigation which we can do uh sorry there's another investigation which i think there's something uh the slide is just a second i'll show you yes sorry this slide it's come over here it should be there with the investigations another investigation that we can do is the serum procalcitonin levels Serum procalcitonin levels, they're associated with bacterial infections and sepsis. And what is this? It is a glycoprotein precursor of calcitonin. And it is produced by the uh, C cells in the thymus. And it can also be synthesized by the leukocytes, by the liver, by the kidney, by the adipocytes and muscles during periods of elevated inflammation. And during periods of severe bacterial, fungal, or parasitic infections, the serum levels might reach to greater than 100, whereas the normal values are usually less than 1. But only modest increases are seen in patients with viral infection or inflammation or non-infectious nature. Meaning, if you have a patient and you're not sure, and um, uh, you suspect, you're suspecting sepsis and they have a very high uh, serum procalcitonin levels, then it means that likely they have some sort of severe bacterial infection, even if the infection is not obvious and you need to give them antibiotics till we wait for the uh, cultures to come. Okay. So... Um, coming, uh, we have discussed the investigations in the investigations. Like I said, we have a complete blood count. We have the liver function test. We have the uh, renal function test. We have tests to look for DIC like PT, APTT coagulation profile. Then we have another test, which is the serum lactate levels. Then we have serum procalcitonin, which rises a great deal multiple times in cases of bacterial infections and sepsis. And then we have interleukin-6, which rises in SIRS, and it is a sign of active inflammation going on in the body. Now, once you have diagnosed or you know that your patient has got sepsis, or then you, we are going to come to the management. Uh, so what we have now is patients with sepsis and septic shock. They require hospital administration in the environment who show no evidence of organ hypoperfusion they can be admitted to a general hospital unit and one that has a close nursing observation of sepsis in the ICU and these patients they can be admitted uh, in the uh, general hospital unit provided there is very close observation going on over there. How? It's because such patients, they do not require invasive hemodynamic monitoring 
and they do not require admission to ICU. However, patients with severe sepsis patients with complications, patients with organ dysfunction, or patients, all patients with septic shock, they need to be admitted to the ICU with close monitoring. Now, what, are, what should be the therapeutic priorities in patients with uh, sepsis? Now, therapeutic priorities for patients with severe sepsis or septic shock include early initiation of supportive care to correct physiological abnormalities such as hypoxemia and hypertension, and distinguishing sepsis from systemic inflammatory response syndrome, because if there's sepsis secondary to an infection, that it must be identified and treated as soon as possible. And um, uh, sometimes the treatment might require antibiotics, and sometimes it might require surgical drainage if like there's an infective abscess or if there's an infective source of infection, if there is a wound infection that we see in patients with diabetic foot and the patient is in sepsis, then they might require urgent debridement or amputation and if you suspect that it is sepsis then you have to even uh, prior to um, uh, the cultures they take time to come and prior to that you need to initiate antibiotics uh, based on uh, which site uh, uh, infection of which site you are suspecting okay now uh, after initial assessment a central venous catheter should be inserted in most patients with severe sepsis or in patients with septic shock a central venous catheter can be used to infuse iv fluids it can be used to give uh, infused medications blood products and especially it can be used for hemodynamic monitoring by monitor by measuring the central venous pressure so another thing that needs to be done in the ICU in patients with septic shock or in severe sepsis is to place a central venous catheter. Uh, then coming to the treatment, uh, uh, patients with severe sepsis might have a relative intravascular hypovolemia and this might be severe. As a result, they might require large volumes infusions of IV fluids. And uh, in, uh, these are required in patients with severe sepsis, in patients with septic shock, or in patients who have coexistent clinical or radiographic evidence of heart failure, in patients who uh, show signs of uh, hypoperf organ hypoperfusion, they might require large amounts of IV fluids. Okay, and the initial fluid resuscitation should be with crystalloids okay patients with hypoperfusion they should receive at least 30 ml per kg of iv crystalloids within the first three hours and they should be reassessed frequently why they need to be reassessed frequently they should be reassessed because most of these patients they might be having comorbidities and they should be reassessed for any signs of uh, volume or fluid overload and for patients who do not maintain the blood pressure in spite of giving crystalloids they require vasopressors and the initial target mean arterial pressure should be 65 millimeters of uh, mercury for patients who uh, do not maintain the blood pressure in spite of giving crystalloids, they should be given vasopressors. And for vasopressors, the first drug of choice is norepinephrine. If the, uh, if the patient still does not maintain their blood pressure, then epinephrine can be added. And for patients who still remain unstable, then dobutamine is recommended. And then you can give IV high steroids or IV hydrocortisone is suggested for patients who are hemodynamically unstable despite the fluids and the uh, vasopressors. Like I said previously, now sepsis is a hyperimmune response of the body uh, to a number of infections. So patients who still do not maintain the blood pressure in spite of fluids and in spite of vasopressors, then they can be given uh, hydrocortisone in a dose of 200 mg per day. And blood transfusion should be reserved for patients who have a hemoglobin concentration of less than seven. Uh, 
except in special circumstances in which there is ongoing hemorrhage in myocardial ischemia. If the patient is having ongoing hemorrhage, then you need to transfuse even if the current uh, hemoglobin comes out to be 7 or and if they are losing a large volume of blood and uh, uh, then you need to transfuse your patients. And platelets should be given if the platelet count is less than 10,000 or if it is less than 20,000 and if your patient is bleeding. Now, this comes in scenarios where the sepsis has complicated into DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation when the platelet count is dropping and these are the criteria for transfusion of uh, platelets. Then another thing that needs to be done is to control the septic focus. Now, uh, to control the septic focus, what we need is prompt identification and treatment of the primary site or the sites of infection. This is the primary therapeutic intervention with most other interventions being purely supportive. Uh, then there's identification of the septic focus. A careful history and examination may yield clues to the source of sepsis. Like if a patient comes to you, they give you a history of fever, cough, shortness of breath, then you know that most likely your patient is uh, suffering from a respiratory tract infection. Similarly, if a diabetic patient comes to you, is brought to you, and they and this complain of burning maturation or difficulty in passing urine, then you know that probably the source of infection is a urinary tract infection. And if you know that sepsis arising after trauma or, sur or surgery is often due to infection at the site of injury or surgery, and the presence of a urinary or vascular catheter increases the chances that these are the sources of infection. So once you identify the source of infection, then blood should be taken from two different venipuncture sites and it should be inoculated into standard blood culture media. Once this is done, once you've identified the source of infection, once you've taken blood from two different sites, then the next step is to give your patient and to, is to determine the antimicrobial regime. regime. And IV antibiotics should be initiated immediately after we have obtained appropriate cultures since early initiation of antibiotic is associated with lower mortality. And the choice of antibiotic may be complex, especially in patients who have recently completed with a course of antibiotics, who have comorbidities or who have uh, community or hospital acquired infections. Uh, so what needs to be done is we need to start an IV antibiotics within the first hour of sepsis recognition, meaning once you have once a patient comes to you, you have decided the patient has got sepsis based on the criteria which I have mentioned above, and you have recognized a source of infection and the blood cultures have been drawn, then it is appropriate uh, to start uh, antibiotics uh, till the uh, cultures are pending and should include combination therapy. In patients who have septic shock, then at least two classes of antibiotics should be uh, chosen in order to cover a known or suspected pathogen. But however, combination therapy is not routinely recommended uh, in patients uh, who uh, present uh, with sepsis and without shock. So the next thing that needs to be done after fluids and after fluids and vasopressors is to draw blood for cultures and uh, to start uh, antibiotics and in patients with septic shock then uh, then you can start two classes of antibiotics uh, for a suspected pathogen till the cultures come the cultures they usually take five to five days to come and pending that you have to start antibiotics Uh, so the sepsis 6 management bundle that needs to be implement, implemented within the first hour of onset of sepsis is to administer oxygen to maintain a saturation of greater than 94, uh, to take blood cultures and consider the infective source, then to identify, then to start IV antibiotics, uh, then to give IV fluids, uh, check serial lactates to see if they're rising or falling. Rising lactates means increasing mortality or worse prognosis. And to uh, monitor the uh, urine out output early. So these are the things that need to be done in the uh, management of sepsis.
okay next you have the complications the multiple organ dysfunction syndrome is altered organ function in an acutely ill patient require who requires medical intervention in order to achieve homeostasis and it can be the end result of septic shock okay and the organ dysfunctions or the complications that can occur are respiratory failure uh, it can be stress ulcers or stress gastritis leading to gi bleeding uh, it can be liver failure it can be renal failure heart failure dic altered mental status due to hypoperfusion of the brain and um, in the end it can be brain death so these are the uh, these are the complications that can result as a result of severe sepsis or as a result of uh, septic shock when the patient is not able to achieve homeostasis or if they in spite of um, all your efforts when the patient is unable to maintain their uh, blood pressure so these are the complications that can uh, occur Uh, so the things that we need to remember are sepsis signs and symptoms they can be highly variable to due to an abnormal dysregulated response and the most common body's response to sepsis or to infection is fever although not an anyone has got a fever uh, so just to recall what is sepsis and what are the uh what is sepsis and what is sars sepsis is the body's immune response to any infection either culture proven or highly suspicious or um and sars is the body's uh, immune response or inflammatory response to a non infectious stimulus all the both are very very closely related to each other then in order to diagnose sars in the absence of any infection if the patient has got a high temperature or a low temperature a high heart rate leukocytosis or leukopenia then you will diagnose if two or more of these signs are present then you will diagnose this as uh, sars however if the same signs are present in the presence of any infection and then you will diagnose this as uh, sepsis and then coming to severe sepsis severe sepsis is uh, uh one in which uh, you see a number of organ dysfunctions as a result of sepsis septic shock is when the patient is unable to maintain the blood pressure as a result of severe sepsis in spite of fluid resuscitation and one of the complications of sepsis is uh, uh, one of the, and then you have the multiple organ dysfunction syndrome in which there are number of organ dysfunctions as a result of failure to achieve homeostasis coming to the investigations you need to go for a blood cp in order to identify leukopenia or leukocytosis then you have investigations such as coagulation profile pta ptd in order to diagnose uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation you go for the liver function test the renal function test the serum lactate uh, rising lactate means a poor prognosis or worse mortality then you have uh, pro serum procalcitonin levels and um, high very high procalcitonin levels means that the patient has got some sort of bacterial uh, infection and antibiotics need to be initiated then you have interleukin 6 which is the inflammatory marker of sars and uh, coming to the management you have uh, uh you need to uh, monitor your patient you need to first decide if the patient needs to be admitted to the icu or to a uh, to a ward where the the where uh, good uh, monitoring of the patient can be done uh, you need to administer fluids if still the patient's blood pressure is not coming up then you need to give vasopressors norepinephrine would be the drug of choice then you need to start antibiotic spending cultures uh, based on the suspected uh, infection of the or the organism uh, which you are suspecting and um, uh, uh, once and um, uh, iv antibiotics iv fluids you need to maintain the oxygen uh, saturation above 94 and you need to uh, you need to uh, and before starting antibiotics you need to send two sets of cultures and then you need to closely monitor your patient you need to monitor you have to monitor uh, the urinary output and the vitals of your patient uh, so this is all with the sepsis and the sars clinical management diagnosis and the complications
क्वेश्चन के लिए मैडम आप इधर आएंगे चैट पे नो डॉक्टर साहब एंटी हिस्टमिन आर नॉट गिवेन यू कैन गिव स्टेरॉइड इन ऑर्डर टू काउंटर द इम्यून रिस्पॉन्स एनी अदर क्वेश्चन Docs up the blood culture results. They do not come uh, before five days. Sometimes, if the lab, uh, if an organism grows in the lab, then they might give you the result after forty-eight hours. And we are not discussing affordability issues right now. These are the guidelines, and you have to send cultures, two cultures, and uh, do not wait for the results to come. But you start antibiotics anyway. You have to start antibiotics. Any other question? Any other question? Better in order to avoid contamination because one site it might be a contaminated sample from the skin. That's why we take cultures from two different sites. beta bacteremia is the presence of bacteria in the blood okay and sepsis is the immune response the body's whole body's immune response to any infection and that result can result in organ dysfunction a bacteremia if it spreads to different sites of the body it can result in sepsis any other question okay thank you so much